And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. This is your RBLR Rays podcast. I'm your host, Zach Dobb, along with my co-host, Pat Davenport. Pat, how you doing? I'm doing well. I, I know I say that every time. I, I, what, what if I one day turned up on the pod and said, I'm actually doing really bad. It's all going wrong. I, I am doing well. Don't worry. I'm, I'm actually fine. I'm not masking anything. And uh, in fact, I'm doing even better because we got breaking news here on the pod Dude. about like an hour before we went on the yeah. air. We we made a big signing, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. I'm doing fantastic, even better when I when I saw that signing because it's it is the Rays. Not to spoil anything of my opinion, but the Rays have answered all of my questions about this off season in the last like two weeks, three weeks with the with the signings that they've made. So I'm a very happy camper. And if you're out there and happy camper, it's probably because you're watching this podcast. And if you want to uh, continue to support. Uh, what, what we're doing here, like and subscribe. That's all we really need from you. Like and subscribe, share it around with all your friends. If you're on YouTube, that like and subscribe really helps us out. We're continuing to build what we're doing here. We're going to do even more fun stuff throughout the rest of the off season. If you're on Spotify, share us around, uh, give, drop us a follow on Spotify. We really do appreciate it. And we've got a really, really good show for you. We got, I think it's a jam packed show. We got a lot to talk about today. We've got some big news in the free agent and trade world, the trade world, not so much with the Rays, but in the AL East, we've got a big signing for the Rays. We've got got a trade in division that there's a lot to talk about and we've got player reviews for the top three arms in the bullpen we'll let you decide who you think those are and we'll tell you in just a little bit but it's a jam-packed show so stay tuned uh we're going to start it off with the big news as you've just said pat the rays have signed as uh, reportedly it's not been officially announced by the team as at last time i saw but it's pretty you know reliably reported that phil maton most recently with the houston astros has been signed by the rays what's your immediate thought on that oh my gosh it, we picked up a veteran kind of already proven reliever in maton 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 one of those two he is an already proven reliever which is a rare thing that the rays go out and do they do occasionally go and do that but usually they go and pick up development projects because they're cheaper and then they're moldable and have team control phil maton is a guy that's been there and done that and was actually one of the astros better relievers last year in fact he had a three mm -hmm. era on the dot last year over 66 innings struck out 74 an era of one sorry a whip of 1.12 he if you go on his baseball savant page there are, I know this isn't the only way we evaluate pitches, but if you've just had a breaking news story and you need to get the, the skinny on a guy, lots and lots of red circles. Listen to this. Hard hit percentage in the hundredth percentile. He is the lowest hard hit percentage in baseball, according to Baseball Savant. Wow. They do not hit the ball hard off him. Average exit velocity against, so how, how hard the ball is hit off of him, 99th percentile. Expected ERA, 90th percentile. Expected batting average, 95th yeah. percentile. He had an expected batting average last year of 192. 192 expected. A 90, 90th yeah. percentile whiff percentage. Yeah. Whoa. This guy is the soft contact king. He is the soft contact king. And that whiff percentage, and in particular, which doesn't show up on Savant, his in-zone whiff percentage, or his in-zone contact percentage, is very low. People are finding it hard to hit the ball off of him, which is crazy because there is one glaring blue circle there, fastball velocity, third percentile. Mm -hmm. Average fastball velocity, 88.9 miles an hour last year. This guy does not throw the ball hard, but oh my gosh, the way the ball moves out of his hand is unbelievable. Particular, if Remy was here, he'd tell you that it is a, uh, I believe, a pronation bias, or is it a supination bias? I've already messed this up. Basically, it moves side to side, which I think is mm -hmm. supination. Supination. Yeah. I think you're right. Uh, yeah, he's a supernator. He started throwing a sweeper quite a lot over the past 18 months, which is, you know, the big in pitch, which if you're a supernator, it goes 
flying across the zone. Uh, yeah. And he started to throw that fastball less and less. He throws a lot of curveballs. He throws a sweeper. He, sw- he throws a, um, a sinker a little bit. Sinker as well, yeah. Yeah. So he's he's a big sweeper, sinker kind of guy. Wow. Tell me what you think of Phil Maton. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about it. It's it's the it's the only thing that I thought maybe was missing from the Rays offseason was bringing in a little bit more experience into the bullpen. They kind of did that with Uwasawa bringing him in as maybe a bulk, maybe a starter. Prisco probably going to start as a starter in my opinion. So then to then go and further solidify the bullpen is just a f- fantastic move. He also has options, which is crazy that a guy with, with the kind of value that he's going to bring in and the kind of experience and the kind of, you know, product he's already brought on the major league level. He still has options, makes him super versatile for the race. I don't think they're going to use him. I think he's probably going to stay at the major league level um, probably all season. Um, he, he pitched 66 innings. I believe it was last year, which yeah. is a, which is a good or sorry. Yeah. Six, six innings, which is a good amount for a reliever. That's that's, that's like not too much. It's kind of like the sweet spot for me right around 65 innings. Any, any more than that, I start to get a little bit worried any less than that. And it's probably, probably because you're not very good or you're getting hurt. So he's in a very nice zone and he's pitched the, and he's pitched those 66 innings for the last three seasons in a row, which is a really good thing for, which is a really good thing to see that he, that he's got some consistency in the, and what he can provide as far as his innings. The thing that I think is interesting, you were talking about some things on his savant page, the thing the, the two numbers that I think are really interesting to look at were are his fastball below that is in the, the, you know, the third percentile, which is really bad. But then I think the interesting thing is you then go to his extension and that's the 96 percentile. And I think that those two, the, you know, when you look at those two numbers, it kind of explains what you're seeing with some of the rest of it. It's that he, while the velocity on his pitches is not very high, his extension is really good. So it makes those play faster. So for those of you who don't know what an extension means as from, from a pitching perspective is you're releasing the ball closer to the plate. So he's releasing the ball in the 96 percentile of closeness to the plate. What that does is it gives the hitter less time to pick up and, and analyze that ball so even if it's slower like he's throwing an average like 88.9 mile per hour fastball that is going to play up one to two to three miles per hour faster because he's releasing it closer to the plate what that also is going to do for his breaking pitches is, is on top of the break that he's already getting that which is phenomenal he is also now releasing it closer to the plate so again gives the pit, the hitters less time to pick it up to make a decision on it and they're you know now they're guessing and that, and that and there you get the high whiff percentage so i think it's really really good signing for the rays i'm really happy with it we kind of thought the rays were done we they yeah. even kind of said as much. So this really came out of the blue for me when I saw this pop up this morning that we were signing him. Um, I'm really excited. I, I it, it kind of completes what was already a really good bullpen and adds just that one more like experienced. Um, you know, he's got some postseason experience with with a with a really good you know team. So a lot of really good things uh, that he's going to bring to the table for the Rays. I'm just super excited. I think it's, I think it's a great signing by the Rays and I'm excited to see him pitch in a Rays uniform. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, someone shared on Twitter, I can't remember who it was, but it was the, the way that all of his pitches kind of spread out from the same release point. So including mm-hmm. with that extension, he releases the ball close to home plate. And also the pitches play so well off of each other that you never know which direction the ball is going to move in when it comes out of his hand, which makes it even harder to hit. So he is a really good reliever. And like you said, a very unexpected one. We don't know the details of how much he's going to get paid. I'm assuming it's probably going to be a one-year deal. It might be have an option attached to it. Who's to who's to know at this point? It's still very early until we get that ironed out. Right. And also, currently the 40-man roster is full, so room is going to have to be made on the 40-man to put him on. Uh, so whether we get a DFA or a trade in the near future, um, we're going to have to look out for that to make room as well. But honestly, yeah, this bullpen is... I don't think we've talked about it really. We've talked at the start of the off season about we were a bit worried or a bit saddened that Diekman and Stevenson, who have now both signed elsewhere, have left the team. Um, where does that leave the bullpen? Well, after doing an assessment now, uh, it's absolutely stacked to the brim with depth as well. Um, the way that roster construction works is you can only carry a maximum of 13 pitches on your 26 man at any given time. So that means, assuming you've got five starters, you've got eight relievers in there. And then you've got Fairbanks, Adam, Poche, uh, Maton. You've got, uh, there's others as well. Um, 
Clevenger, Kevin Kelly, Chris Davinsky, Sean Armstrong. That's, that's yep. eight right there. And if those are your eight that you're running with, that's really good. There's not a single bad arm in there. And nope. that's super. And then, you know, if one of them goes down, Uwasawa could join the bullpen. Alexander could join the bullpen. Miguel Rodriguez, who we acquired at the trade deadline last year, um, they're all available. And that doesn't include if Colby White starts to get good back down mm -hmm. in the minors again. So mm -hmm. not only is the bullpen stacked, it's stacked with depth which is what I love so much. I mean, it's it's almost salivating how good this bullpen is shaping up to be this year. Yeah, I think the only thing that is a, like a it's a it's such it's a it's a minor concern cuz I don't think it's going to really affect us in like super heavily is that we're a little bit righty heavy. We have we're a little bit light on left-handed guys, but our left-handers are some of our best arms in Poche and Clevenger to really really top of the top of the bullpen arms. So it's not a huge area of concern, but it is a area of like minor minor concern, but that's like a nitpick. Like I we're like we're nitpicking the bullpen at this point. It's an excellent yeah. bullpen. It's got experience on it. It's got uh, lots of different arm angles, lots of different ki kinds of stuff. It's it's a it's a whole kitchen sink that we're going to be throwing at opposing lineups. The last kind of thing I wanted to mention on Phil Maton, I, I I sort of was curious because I know he's he's been a part of Houston. I mentioned he's got some postseason experience. I was just kind of curious how he's performed in the postseason because this is a team that is we we want to go to the. To, to the big dance. We want to go to the postseason. We want to have success there. So I was just kind of curious what he's done in the postseason. He is pitched in three postseasons, 2020 with the Cle with the Guardians, uh, 2021 with the Astros when they went to the World Series, and then last year with the Astros as well. In in those three um th those three years, he's he's pitched in six series. He's pitched in 21.2 innings. Just just as a wild guess, guess how many runs he's given up over those 21.2 innings. Four, five, two. Whoa! He has given up two earned runs in twenty, almost twenty-two innings over six series, including five games he pitched during the World Series. He pitched all five games of that. I think it was, I think it was the five, maybe it was six games. I can't remember. But he pitched five games in that World Series versus Atlanta. No runs given up. Wow! Not a single run given up. And he's and he act, he didn't give up any runs last year either. He pitched six innings in the postseason last year, didn't give up any runs. So not only is this a guy who's bringing a lot of you know a lot of really cool stuff, he, he, we're excited to see him pitch. He's got the experience and the performance you know resume in the in the postseason. So I don't know what more you could ask for. For, from from Phil Baton. I'm super excited to, to for him to be on the staff. I can't wait to see him pitch. Yeah, I think what everyone is asking online is right now is like, how did he sneak all the way down to this late in the right. offseason and all the way to the Rays, who won't be the first team to go out and shell out for a reliever like that? Yeah. So I don't know how he's managed to sneak by, but the Rays have clearly made a good pitch to him. Kyle Snyder, mm -hmm. Kevin Cash will probably say, hey, you're really good already. Imagine what happens when you come over to the shop and we utilize your stuff even better. I mean, there's probably not much more room because he was so good last year to develop and he is 30, but... That's quite good, just getting a guy that you can just plug and play and you know you don't have to do any work on him, which is yep. amazing. So, yeah, super, super stoked for this signing. In news that I think we are maybe not super stoked on, there was some other big news this week in the American League East, and that is the news that the Baltimore Orioles have traded for Corbin Burns. It was kind of one of the big shoes we were, we were waiting to drop of the offseason season. And it dropped, and it dropped to a team that I don't think we're super excited about. Uh, Burns to the Orioles. Are, are you? Are how much more scared of the Orioles are you after having this this trade go through? Uh, quite a bit. Um, the Orioles are what came into the offseason a team with a definite uh, weakness. Uh, their lineup was pretty much set. They knew what they were doing in terms of top to bottom with the order, and no one was really leaving of any significance. The rotation, however, was a little bit thin on the ground. Um, Kyle Bradish, John Means, Grayson Rodriguez were kind of going to lead the line for them. But everyone was going, ah, none of those guys are like a stopper. None of those guys are like, they're definitely going to be amazing next year. Like Kyle Bradish was good, but people have concerns about whether or not he's in line for a bit of regression next year. Uh, and then 
Uh, Grayson Rodriguez finished the year strong, but he's still very young, so there's a lot of volatility there in him. And John Means is still reco- like he's back now, but he he does have health issues sometimes. So you know he's not always the most dependable. Who's the guy that's going to lock down that staff? Probably the the best pitcher in the in the whole league over the past three years. Corbin Burns will probably fill that gap. Oh, it's not great. It's not great uh, that he's going to be taking the bump every five days for a division rival because. If the one thing that I was kind of banking on for the Orioles next year was they got a bit of luck uh, last year in terms of how they did in one run games and they managed to stay relatively healthy. Um, So I was like, as long as they like just pretend that that isn't due for a little bit of, you know, regression because of the way their luck worked out. But they were like, no, we're going to take a little bit of volatility out of our roster construction by just adding a really consistent, really good pitcher. Bums me out. I think the Orioles are really good. Well, anyway, but now even better because of that, which is demoralizing. I was hoping they were kind of just not going to do anything, but they made the move that they absolutely should have made. And I guess it's about time, but it it, it sucks for everyone else in the division. What do you think? Yeah, it's kind of – we've mentioned it a couple times in the podcast. I've dunked on the Orioles a little bit because I just they're, – they're doing nothing. That's what I, I had said the last time we brought them up. I said, what are you doing? You're not doing anything. Like, And they did something, and it's exactly what I – if you had asked me what do they need to do to improve their roster, like specifically it's get a top of the rotation starter to take pressure off of Grayson Rodriguez because I think that's the one thing that they're – like the best version of this – Orioles team is one where Grayson Rodriguez realizes his, his true potential or his his expected potential um, as he was coming up through the minors of a one-two starter. I don't think making him the one-two guy this year was going to help with that. It's going to continue to put him in a spot where he might not perform well. He performed really poorly last year and to continue to put him at the top of the rotation and say, you're the guy. I don't know that that's the best way to develop him right now. I think he needs a little bit, uh, he needs a little bit of time to cook a you know, even and it can be at the major league level, but he, he, to be the guy that they train and say, "Hey, you're the stopper." Don't think that's a good thing for his development. And so they went and did exactly what they needed to and got a stopper. They got, like you're saying, one of the, if not the most valuable pitcher over the last three years. He's put up, I, I think it's like almost 18 WAR, F WAR over the last three years. It's crazy. He had that amazing season in 2021 where he put up 7.5 F WAR and was just the best pitcher in baseball that year. Um, and he's, you know, even in those limited innings, he pitched that year, he was absolutely outstanding. And I think the thing that I look at when I'm looking at his stats, one of the things that is kind of developed in me as a, as a fan and as an observer of of baseball, generally, when I look at a pitcher as a starter, one of the first stats that I used to look at when I was just sort of first getting into it were things like ERA and strikeouts and all that. Nowadays, when I look at a pitcher as especially a starter, one of the first things that I look at is innings pitched. Can we rely on you? Can you go out there? Because, you know, as you know, from following this team religiously and now following it even more so on the pod, you you see the value of just a guy being able to go out there and provide innings. And that is what cease or sorry, that is what Burns has been able to do recently. The last two seasons, he has provided over 190 innings pitched. That's a big deal for this Orioles team that needs some stability. And that it's exactly the kind of move they need to make. The now, the one thing that I think is, you know, jumping a little bit ahead of ourselves is some people are starting to say, oh, the Orioles are running the East. They're gonna be the the the, the class of the East going forward. You know, it, it's over for the rest of the East. No, that's not true. Because while he's really good and it's really cool, it's a one-year deal that he's on right now. So maybe they're going to re-sign him. I think they probably will, and I think they probably should. But at this moment in time, he is only under contract with the Orioles for this year. He could leave after next year. So while it's a great thing that they got him, they also gave up a a pretty good shortstop prospect, shortstop prospect, a pretty good back end of the bullpen prospect that has he maybe has starter upside. I think he's his bet his best upside is probably more towards you know the back of the bullpen and DL Hall and the thirty fourth pick in the draft, which you know draft picks are kind of whatever they're 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 kind of a wild card, but it's not nothing. So they definitely gave like we. 
I don't think nobody got fleeced. I don't think people don't usually get fleeced on the, on the major league level. Like it's not really happening. You know, like, I mean, you, you might get fleeced in your fantasy draft. M- MLB GMs are usually not getting fleeced. There's, it's usually, you know, a reason if it looks imbalanced, there's a reason for it. And in this case, it's pretty balanced, you know, offering that was, that was given back and forth, especially when you consider the Brewers may move on from Adamas at some point, having Ortiz coming in. That's the other prospect the Orioles gave up was, it was a shortstop by the name of Ortiz. And he is going to be, a guy that profiles as a starting shortstop. So that could be a, a really good thing for them. And they could also allow them to trade Adamas if they wanted to, to get some more value from him. So like, it was a good move for both sides, but it is the move the Orioles needed to make. So while it was a good move, I'm not like, I'm not like shaking in my boots, but it is the move that they needed to make in my opinion. Yeah. Um, to drink some copium, to take in some copium, the the ERA has gone up every year since 2021. I mean, it was hard yeah. to get lower than 2021, but he, yeah. he did pitch to a 3.39 ERA, which is still very good, but nowhere near as good as what he has shown. Um, the strikeout numbers are a bit lower. Again, 200 is still elite, but I'm like, maybe he's regressing. This is copium. I don't think he actually is going to be bad, <laughs> but maybe yeah. maybe he is regressing a little bit and he won't be the best pitcher in the league, hopefully. That's all I can really say. That's that's best case scenario for the Rays is he's not a top five pitcher in the league. <laughs> um, yeah. um, and that's pretty, pretty much the best we can hope for. It was a good move for both sides. Uh I'm bummed because the Orioles were already going to be tough to go up against this year. Yeah. And they are even better. It does beg the question. The Rays have a pretty decent starting rotation. They don't, necessarily, unless you count Zach Eflin, who could be a stopper, there's no one else that's like, yeah, they're going to come in and we know they're going to be great. Okay. Latell, we don't know he's going to be great. Savali, we don't know he's going to be great. Pepio, don't know he's going to be great. Bradley, Bradley Bars, Uasawa, don't know they're going to be great. Someone who we think is pretty much going to be great is Dylan Cease, and he's a trade candidate right now over in the White Sox org. Mm-hmm. His ERA wasn't great last year. He did regress after an amazing 2022. He did regress a bit in 2023, but he still is like one of the best stuff guys in the league, uh, strikeout monster machine. If the Rays could get their hands on him and get him to command his stuff a little bit better, um, maybe he could be an absolute monster. I whipped up a hypothetical for you. Uh, This is, I guess, a semi-comparable package to what Mm -hmm. the Orioles gave up for Corbin Burns. Xavier Isaac and Yoniel Cure for Dylan Cease. Cure is probably the best or one of the better arms at the upper end of the minors for the Rays. Uh, And then Xavier Isaac is probably like in their top three position player prospects, which is, I guess, what the Orioles kind of gave up. Yeah, number one first base prospect, Xavier Isaac. Yeah, yeah. Would you make that trade of Xavier Isaac and Yoniel Cure for Dylan Cease? I would not. But that being said, my saying yes to that is based on my sort of, my feeling that the Rays are going to get healthy, you know, going, going throughout the rest of this season. If mm-hmm. I didn't think they were going to get healthy, then I probably would make that trade. But the but the reason that I don't is because not only do I think they're going to get healthy, I think the reason why I wouldn't do it speaks to why I also think that the Rays are just a better organization than the Orioles. As good as they are right now and as well set up as they are, the Rays are a better organization. They're better set up for success in the future. And the reason why is I think right now there are three pitchers that are better than Dylan Cease currently sitting on the Rays IL right now. And Shane McClanahan, Drew Rasmussen, and Jeffrey Springs. I would take all three of those guys over Dylan Cease personally. Wow. That may that wow. may not be, you know, most people's opinion, but I, I've never been like super enamored with Dylan Cease. Like he's good. I'm not saying he's not good. He is very good. But I've just never been super enamored with him and giving up a guy at first base who could be the heir apparent whenever Yandy Diaz leaves, that would be a tough ask. I think the trade package is fair. Like, I think it, that's what it would take. It would take a really high end prospect in, in Xavier Isaac, and then also a really good bullpen arm in Yanni El Cure, who's been excellent as in, in a, in a relief role and in a kind of a closer role so far in his career. He's really, really good. That's what it, I think it, that would be a fair trade. 
I don't think that I would do it personally, but if they did it, I would probably, I mean, I'd probably be excited. I mean, it'd be really cool, but I just don't think the Rays need to because of what they have, because while everything you said is true about the, these guys, we, we don't know if they're going to be great. Even if they aren't, even if they're okay, or maybe one or two of them are bad, the reinforcements are already coming from, from an internal location. And I don't know that I am a huge, because I don't know that I'm a huge fan of mortgaging the future of the team over getting better in a position in which we're already going to get better naturally by guys returning from injury. That being said, if we did it, I'd be super excited and it'd be really cool. But I, if you, if I was the GM of the Rays, I would not make that trade. But if, but I would have to think about it because it is a, it is a fair offer and Cease is really good. Yeah, I don't think I would make it either. It's, it's a bittersweet spot in the rotation right now. The 2024 Rays rotation is kind of bittersweet where like we've got loads of good guys and loads of like people that have lots of upside but still have some stuff to prove. But also we got like three really good guys that we've just got to like wait for. Yeah. And in 2025, it's going to be super complicated how we fit all of them into the picture. But that's a great problem to have. And it, it would is. be silly to add another arm to that mix that's already absolutely jam-packed, loaded with great arms and not having room for them all anyway and giving up, you know, your second best position player prospect, maybe third best and a really good arm, I think. Xavier Isaac, I'm super high on. So I wouldn't make the trade either, but I was just like, it's a thinker. Um, let us know in the comments uh, or tweet at us if you would make that trade because maybe maybe we're missing something. And here's the one thing that I think we could be missing. And I'm very optimistic. I'm an optimistic guy, generally speaking. I'm optimistic about the the, the Rays, you know, these, these pitchers that we're relying on to return from injury and be really good. If I'm Eric Neander, and somebody slides across my desk an injury report for those guys, and it doesn't look the way I want it to. I might do it because even though I think the I think it's you know I don't think it's an overpay, but it definitely would be tough to see those guys leave, and that we do have guys that could get healthy and be great. We've also had a lot of injuries in, in our rotation, so to bring in a guy who, while he is not you know he he's not been the healthiest man to ever live, he has had some injuries history here and there he's been mostly healthy the last three seasons he, he's not pitching a whole bunch of innings um but he's been mostly healthy the last three years so i i could see the case for it because you can really never have too much pitching because somebody's gonna get hurt you're gonna trade you could trade somebody if you have that if you really do have that much value it'd be a great trade piece if, to get something else that you need so i don't think i wouldn't do it just because we'd have too many good guys i think it's more of a you know we don't, it's not necessarily like if you have it, if you consider Xavier Isaac as an asset and you feel the need to make a move, I don't know that that's the area of the team I would improve right now. I think there are other, there's other things I might do. If we're, if we're going to say we're going to trade him, I might do other things with that. Hmm. But I do think if you are, if, if, if there's any concern at all, if the race have any concern at all about these guys, like Dra Rasmussen Springs and McClanahan coming off of the IL and being really, you know, high level performing if you have any concerns about that this is a i would totally change my mind if i feel yeah. like hey i not only my maybe i'm not going to get mcclanahan back and maybe rasmussen's also not going to come back maybe springs you know it's not looking great so he may even come back even later if any of that stuff kind of starts to you know pop into the mind of a of eric Neander, if he sees any of that kind of information come across his desk which we don't have any evidence that it has and that's why i say i wouldn't do the trade but if you did have that information I think that would totally change my, you know, my, my viewpoint. And I would make that trade because I, I, I do think, I don't know that I'm as, I don't feel as good about this raise rotation. If you tell me this is the rotation the whole year, like yeah. I start to feel less good about it. Like a lot of my feelings about the strength of the raise rotation is kind of based on the idea that guys are going to get healthy and we're going to see them, you know, kind of make a, you know, make a move to come back into the rotation. But if they're, but if they don't get healthy and Boz and Bradley don't develop, you're in kind of a tough spot for this rotation. So if you're not confident in their health, I would make the trade. If you are confident, I wouldn't. Yeah. If someone like Latal or Savali gets seriously hurt in spring training, does it become a no brainer? Right. Uh, it becomes a no brainer at that point. Yes. It becomes a no brainer because now you're down a guy and you're also, it's all these injury guys are a maybe. Uh, yeah. It's a no, it, it becomes an immediate no brainer. If anybody goes down and if, and if the, White Sox GM, whomstever his name is, I don't know what his name is. If he calls, if he calls you up and says, "Hey, 
Xavier Isaac and Yanyo Kure for Dylan Cease. I'm saying yes before he finished saying he finished just saying Kure's <laughs> name because at that point you've got to get somebody in there because I really don't think it's a good idea to put pressure on both Boz and Bradley to be you know top of middle of top of your rotation guys this early. Like it's not a good idea. So I would one million percent make the trade in that in that scenario. Yeah. I, I think I think I'm, I'm with you the whole way there. I'd say not right now, but if something crazy happens in spring training, something really unfortunate, then it's something we've really got to got to consider. But until then, I'm pretty happy with the with the pitching core as it is right now. I wouldn't say I'm like overwhelmed, but I'm like I'm whelmed. You know, You're I'm whelmed. not under yeah, I'm not underwhelmed and not overwhelmed. I'm just whelmed. You know, which yeah. is fine because we've got such a good bullpen to back up this rotation that I'm not super scared about early on in the season them needing only five innings or even four innings every now and then yeah and the bullpen is something we're going to talk about in just a second but before we get there if you are feeling kind of whelmed with your <laughs> with your wardrobe if you look at if you're looking in your your drawers of your of your you know your dresser and you're looking you're feeling kind of whelmed and what you've got sitting in there uh, I have a solution for you. If you want to be overwhelmed with the with the quality of what's sitting there in your wardrobe, go to shop at rblrsports.com where you can get 10% off anything that you want to get there, any of the amazing Tampa Bay Rays or other, you know, fan merch of other Tampa sports teams that you want to get is right there at shop at rblrsports.com. Promo code FLAPPY, 10% off everything that you want to get there. Make your wardrobe something that overwhelms you with its amazingness, like the Rays, like the Rays bullpen and like the Rays lineup. Makes me overwhelmed with happiness. Do that for yourself. Shop that RBLR, shop dot sports dot com. Someone that overwhelms me on a on a regular basis is Pete Fairbax. Yes, he is a scary guy. If there's one guy in the league, I would be terrified to take an at bat against. Is Pete Fairbanks? If I was, yeah, Crazy Eyes himself. He, he, oh, I just knowing what he can throw and knowing the kind of mentality he has on the mound, I would fear for my life. Yeah. <laughs> Let's play a review, Pete Fairbanks. Let's do uh, it. We'll get some, you get some, first. get your eye drops ready, and let, let, let's dive right into it. A uh, Pete Fairbanks, uh, another fantastic season for the Rays. Uh he he's he is the I would would you consider him the number one closer option for the Rays right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. He is I think on a at bat to at bat basis the guy that is most likely to deliver you an out and in particular mm. a strikeout which late in games the less balls in play you have the better because that takes the randomness out of baseball when the ball goes into play anything could happen if you strike a guy out there's only one outcome he's out so when you want late in the game you want as little variance as possible in come pete fairbanks he will strike you out and he's super super good at doing that um he didn't pitch enough innings to like fully register on baseball savants uh like uh percentile ranking but in uh, the American League last year, he was fourth in strikeouts per nine uh, amongst people that threw at least 40 innings, uh, behind only Matt Brash of Seattle, Aroldis Chapman, and Felix Bautista. Felix Bautista, wow. not going to be around uh, for most of next year. So of pitchers that are going to pitch next year, he would be the third best in strikeout per nine uh, in the American League. Crazy. So he is he is that guy that will take the variance out of your ninth inning. He will blow you away with insane fastball velocity, really good breaking pitches off the back of that. He commands it pretty well most of the time, but he is known to the occasional blow up of command. But when he's locked in, he will just strike out the side. And he has that kind of um, safe mentality. The one thing that you got to watch out a little bit for is his home runs per fly ball rate is like higher than you'd want it to be. 11% of his fly balls become home runs. But other than that, he's, he's really good. He's really safe. I'm happy with him. Do you have any concern about the like can't pitch in the cold narrative that's kind of been circulating over the past year or so? So I don't have a huge, and, and I'll tell you, I don't have a huge concern about it. It's because of somebody else we're going to talk about here in just a second. Um, but I think the addition of Phil Maton even makes me even less concerned about it. Because I think where where Fairbanks would, you know, 
maybe not perform the way we'd like him to is if he was being overused the way that Batista was last year, the way we've seen some, some of the closers get overused in previous in you know, in other seasons, if he was being overused all the time, I think we might see the cracks show a little bit, but the, the Rays know what the kind of value he can bring and they know when to use him and when not to use him. And I think they've struck a really good balance with that. So I'm not really super worried about it. I think if you if you do what you're supposed to do during during the regular season, you play most of your games in the dome during the postseason, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I think that that's I think that's 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 your goal anyway. Just win a bunch of games, so it doesn't matter. You play in the dome, who cares? Yeah. Um, and a lot of the teams, you know, there, there's quite a few teams that are like top threats in the American League that play in a dome. So even in the postseason, like the Yankees, you're playing outside, but if but the Astros, you're playing in a dome. So even even just in the American League, it's it's not necessarily a huge huge issue that he might have those cold fingers. I mean, maybe if you're playing the Guardians again, but I I don't see them, you know, improving. Maybe the Twins, but like there's 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 an easy way to mitigate all that and that's just win and i think that the rays are going to do that so i don't think it's going to be a huge huge issue i think that they have they've they've struck a good balance in how much to use him he 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 sat about 45 innings last year i really don't want him pitching more than 55 innings i don't think it's necessary i don't think i think we have a, we are not so dependent on like one guy to be the closer every single time i don't think it's i don't think we i just don't think we need it uh, you know, for this team with the kind of bullpen that we have, there's multiple guys who can take the ball in the ninth that I'm, I'm happy with and confident with. I think in the biggest moments, he's the guy he's shown the ability to, to show up when, when we need him to, and to, and to pitch really, really strongly in, in moments of pressure. So I have no concerns there. Um, I, I think that he's not going to pitch 70 innings. I don't think he ever should though. So I think if he's pitching around that 45, 50, 55 inning mark, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think he needs to be overused. He is a high leverage arm that we don't want to use too, too often. Yeah. He is awesome, though. And he is the closer as long as he stays healthy, which, you know, he's not yeah. always the healthiest. But if we can, you know, manage his workload effectively, don't use him too, too much, like you said. He'll be he'll be golden. Uh, super happy with him going in with the with the I don't want to say the closer role because I don't think that's how the Rays do things anymore. But like num numero uno high leverage guy. Numero uno. No. Let's call him numero uno. Yeah, if you were gonna give we'll call him numero uno. Numero uno. We give that that can be his new nickname. Uh, if you were gonna give numero uno a letter grade for for last year, what would it be? Uh, I would give him a minus. A minus, really, really good. Um, you just, I, you did go on the IL a little bit, so it can't be yeah. like an A plus. But he, he was super good. I'd give him like an A minus. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. A minus. I think he's, you know, when he's when he's fully healthy and when he is being used properly, he's really, really good. Do you, do you, are you kind of in the same boat as me that you expect him to, you know, be really good and pitch about fifty to fifty five innings, or do you think it'll be anything different than that for him going into next year? No, I think exactly that. I think exactly that. Let's keep him healthy. Let's just, you know, use him in the biggest moments when we need big strikeouts and stuff like that. Yeah, there's no need to try and push him a la Felix Bautista or anything like that. There's no need to. We've got such a stacked bullpen that there's no need to make him work any more than an inning at a time. And we'll just take it, take it chill. Just remember, you guys, I don't I kept receipts of 2021 when we traded Nick Solak away for, for Pete Fairbanks. And everyone said we mm -hmm. got fleeced because he like did well for like a month in Texas. Right. Um, Nick Solak hit to a 638 OPS uh, in 2022 and didn't play a single major league game in 2023. So can we just like I just want to keep the receipts of anyone that said we shouldn't have traded Nick Solak for Pete Fairbanks. Uh, I kept those receipts and you're on blast now. That's good to know. I think it is. Good to know. <laughs> I think the thing that is the funnest thing about Pete Fairbanks is that he's just the most dominant guy in maybe not in all of MLB. I think maybe Batista is maybe the most dominant, but he is one of the most dominant guys out there when he's, when he's going at full speed, he's completely dominant. I think the thing that makes me even more confident about him and the confidence to say, Hey, we can use him a little bit less is another guy in the bullpen. And that's Jason Adam. Do you buy into any of the the stuff that's been said about him that he's kind of, you know, he is a lesser version. He had a, a down ish year. Do you buy into any of that, that he's starting to regress and he's not going to be as good going forward? 
I mean, he did have a down year compared to his 2022, but like it would have been unfair for him to be anywhere near his 2022 season. In 2022, he had a 1.56 ERA. Like that's just unrealistic to expect that again. He still was sub three. He still was striking a load of guys out. He was still um, doing really well in high leverage. I am going to, this is not, this is not me being a hater, but last year I hated watching Jason Adam pitch. I hated it so much because he would always like get the save and he would always like get out of the jam, but he would like leave it to the last possible moment. He was walking tight ropes every time he was out there. Like he would walk guys and then leave them on, or he would like a fly ball to the warning track that could have like been a walk off home run. I remember that Aaron judge one where he pulled the face afterwards. Um, Oh, he was he was a nightmare to watch. But you know what? It's a results-based business, and he did get the results last year. So while he was excruciating to watch, he was still really, really effective for the Rays uh, this past year. And yeah, I guess he did regress, but like reasonably so to still being, instead of being like impossibly good, he was just like really good. Yeah, and I think one thing that's kind of at least a little bit interesting to me was that if you look year over year, what his the change in his stats, one of the ones that I think is kind of interesting was his BABIP went up 40 points from 194 to 239 over the last over last season. So he was having even just a little bit less luck on balls in play. I don't think it's anything to be overly concerned about. He's still, you know, going out there and giving us really high quality stuff. His, his strikeouts per nine are actually up. The walks per nine are up, but not drastically. So just up a little bit. So the one thing that I do think is a little bit concerning is his, his giving up a little bit more home runs than we're used to. And I think that was, we, we saw that a couple times where he gave up some inopportune home runs, that's the one thing to be a little bit concerned about with him. So I think that, but again, and whenever we talk about things that we we see as issues with players, you can rest assured that, you know, Kyle Snyder and the rest of the team there on, on, in the Rays are aware of these issues as well and are working on them. So I guarantee you that they also see these numbers and see these things spiking that maybe shouldn't be spiking. And I guarantee you that over the off season and over spring training and through what, you know, as we're moving through this, that they're going to be making those adjustments that need to be made to, to, to help those things with him. I don't know exactly what it, what it's going to look like. I, I don't know if maybe they just need to make some adjustments with the location of some of his pitches, maybe some sequence that needs to change a little bit, but I know that they're going to make those adjustments that are needed because the stuff is still excellent from, from him. He's still, he's the stuff is still really, really good. That hasn't changed too much. So I expect him to still be really, really good next year. And I expect him to continue to be kind of their fireman. That's kind of what Jason Adam has been over the last few years. Fairbanks has kind of been the closer. Adam has been the closer when needed, but he's also kind of been the fireman where when we're in a spot where, Hey, the we're in the eighth, they're one, two, three guys are up. We need to take care of them so we can get to the ninth. That's the one that you send Jason Adam in. Or if it's, Hey, it's the seventh inning. We're seeing the one, two, three guys or the sixth inning. Hey, we're seeing the one, two, three, and we really need to take these guys out. He's the, he's the guy they send in, in those high leverage moments. Even if they're earlier in the game, they can still be high leverage. And he performs really, really well in those moments. While last year he had some tough outings here and there, he was still getting the good result most of the time. I, 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 it's easy, especially with relievers, to let a couple bad outings color their entire season where, you know, he pitched 54 innings. Maybe like seven or eight of those were like, are what is coloring a lot of what our uh, memories of him are because he had some tough outings in some of those innings. But in reality, He's pitching really well almost all the time. He's getting the good result that we want almost all the time. So while I think there were some some outings we didn't love last year, at the end of the day, it's another good season for Jason Adam. Yeah, it was a good season for Jason Adam. The biggest alarm bell for him is that he was in the first percentile of barrel percentage last year. Yeah, People were smacking the ball pretty hard off him uh, with more regularity than you'd like. He tended to get away with it. Um, I think by the end of this coming season, by the end of 2024, he will not be the kind of number two guy in the high leverage role. I think he'll be overtaken by either Mayton or by um, Clevenger or Poche or someone else that we bring in mid-season or call up mid-season. Uh, because I still think, I, I worry, I worry about that barrel percentage and I'm not sure if his best has already happened. But, mm. This season was still really good 
for Jason Adam. Uh, and if I were to give him a grade, I would give him a B plus. What would you give him? I think that's a pretty good. Uh, Pam is a big fan of Jason Adam. She just she just wanted to stop it and let everybody know that she's a big Jason Adam fan. Uh, she might give him an A plus. I'm going to give him a B plus along with you. I yeah. think that um, he had a a really good season, but it wasn't the best we've seen from him, and it wasn't necessarily up to his standards. Is it possible the best is behind him? I don't know. I will say if there is a scenario in which he is not the number one guy or like the number one guy of the bullpen in a danger zone, where you've got if you've got other guys that are your number one guy, if he now is kind of a depth piece, if he slides back into that role because of the performance of others, he becomes really really dangerous as your number three. If he's if Jason Adams your number three guy, you've got a really really good bullpen like you've got a really really good bullpen so i think it's just another evidence of how deep that the Rays bullpen is that we can even have that conversation and another piece of that depth is another guy who we got really excited about um while he was pitching and then he kind of stopped pitching because he got hurt and that's garrett clevenger um do you think that we you kind of hinted at it do you think garrett clevenger is going to step into a larger role as he comes back healthy for the Rays this season yeah, I think he was. He only, he only managed to pitch twelve innings last year uh, to a three ERA, which twelve innings we don't even care about ERA really. But like yeah. in those twelve innings, he looked really, really good and really, really promising. He is um, really tough to pick up the ball from. He has a really funky kind of left-handed side arm angle. He is really good at getting soft contact. He's really good at picking up strikeouts as well. So. I really like him, and as a, I think he's going to be the primo lefty. I think he's going to be our number one left-handed option when we need a guy to come out from that side. And I think he's got some really cool stuff, and I think he's going to be really important to the 2024 Rays. There's not too much to talk about because he got that really unfortunate injury uh, really early on, but the Rays picked him up at the deadline in 2022, and we liked him even when we picked him up, and. He showed in very limited time that he is going to be a dangerous weapon for the Rays in 2024. What do you think of Clev? Yeah, I think he's really, really good. I think right now, Poche is still my number one lefty out of the bullpen until further notice. Um, I'm a big Poche guy. I think he's really good, and I think he has been really good for this team for a long time, and it's been kind of undervalued um, for a long time. I expect him to still be really good next year, so he's my number one, at least for right now. But I do think Clevenger has potential to be that, and I'd love to see him develop into that. It's going to just be a question of I, the injury was fluky. I don't expect it to be like a, a, a thing with him. I expect yeah. him to be fine going forward. Um, and when he is fine, he's been really, really good. And I am excited to see the kind of that kind of high value lefty available for us. I think if he could, if he becomes the number one lefty out of the out of the bullpen, I think he becomes our number two guy, like you've said, uh, over Jason Adam, just because I think it's it, 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 having, you know, that lefty arm coming out of the bullpen is, is definitely going to mess with a lot of hitters. So mm -hmm. he, he does a lot of things to really confuse batters along with having some pretty good velocity as well. So I'm really excited to see him back and healthy this, this coming season. Um, I do think at least for now, Poche is my number one lefty, but I would love to see Clevenger pitch well enough to be in that role going forward. Yeah, I mean, the great thing is we've just got so many options and the competition to be in this bullpen is going to be insanely tough. So even if he's not great and or needs a bit more time, we've got so many ways that we can, we can you know, switch and send him down to the minors to work on some stuff. I'm just super stoked about this bullpen. I don't think there's anyone that I'm worried about coming into a game. It's just, they're all amazing and... Oh, it makes me super excited about this 2024 team. I can't I can't think any more highly about how we've put this roster together, apart from maybe a backup catcher. It I just need spring to start now because I'm just I know. I'm, I'm so excited about all the all this pitching. Do you think the Rays have anything to do before now and, and pitches and catches reporting in two weeks? I really don't think so. I mean, I thought they were done and I was pretty, I was like fine with it at the end of it. Now I'm really happy. I'm really happy with the way the Rays have set themselves up for the next season after adding Matan. I think they're in a really, really good place. Um, I don't think they need to do anything else. If they do anything else, it would be gravy. It would be like, you know, really putting us over the top in value for this, this coming season. Um, mm. I don't expect it. I don't really like the only thing I could see happening is maybe we could see the move for, for Harold, like him getting moved. I could see that maybe, but that's really the only move I see. Other than that, I think we're kind of set and I'm really happy with this team as constructed. 
Yeah, me too. Like you said, the Harold move could even be what kind of precursor is trying to fit Maton onto the roster because we do need to find the spot. And I would hope that hopefully we can do something a little more creative than just DFAing a guy if we yeah. could find like a package for Harold or something creative. Um, then that would be even better. But uh, I guess I should say that Topkins tweeted really recently that apparently the assigning is is not done yet. Apparently we're, we're talking to him, but it's actually not done yet. It's the latest development after all that talking that we've after just done. After all that talk, it's not actually done. But I would be surprised if it doesn't get done. I think it will still yeah. get done. I don't think things get reported as this late stage and unless they're like pretty sure things to happen, yeah. unless like a medical issue comes to light or something like that yeah we're just gonna you know keep whistling on as if as if you know everything's fine and just assume that he's gonna make it i i agree with you Fizan is the one who tweeted it out um originally I, I think generally speaking he's not the one to just tweet stuff out just because um i'm i'm fairly certain that this you know this got leaked because somebody wanted it leaked yeah and because uh they wanted him to know that that's where he was signing so I'm going to, I'm going to guess and say that it's going to be fine and it's all going to go through, but that is, that is interesting. And we'll have to keep our eyes on that. Yeah. Hopefully by next week, we could just confirm that and say, Hey, look, uh, the, the, the Maton signing is official, which is hopefully what we'll be doing next week, but we've got plenty of other amazing stuff coming up very soon uh, yeah. before we wrap up the off season. So that's very, very exciting. And it's a reason why you should stay tuned to the RBLR Rays show. And while you're staying tuned, do us a favor, like, and subscribe. You're, you're already here. You're already on YouTube. If you're watching us there, just hit the like and subscribe button. If you're, if you're listening on Spotify, just, just, you know, close the app on your phone, swipe on over to wherever the YouTube app is on your phone, tap that button, hop on over to the RBLR page and subscribe. There's all kinds of great stuff there. There's bucks off season stuff going on. The lightning are in full swing. The rowdies mm -hmm. are getting ready to get started soon. There's great the content. They There's had an interview new coach with, with the new coach. Yes, you should listen to that. If you if you are at least even mildly interested in the Rowdies, you should go listen to that interview. Like as soon as you finish listening to this, you should go listen to that. There's all kinds of great stuff all across the network. Do yourself a favor, subscribe, be around for all the cool stuff that's coming down the pipe. It's the cool thing about subscribing and about you know following our pages. You don't just get us, which would be enough, but you also get all this other great stuff. And it's I mean it's just it's free. Just just hit the button. It's free. It, it's yeah. a it, you should do it. Uh, and Anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up? No, I don't think so. If you are on Spotify, you can rate us five stars. That's something mm. you can do. Just to, can. just to, and and just tell your friends. Be like, hey, I know you like the Rays because you're a smart baseball fan. And smart baseball fans tend to like the Rays. Go, sure. do you know? Do you know if you would scratch that Rays itch for you of the off season? Uh, these two fellas right here just talking about talking about the Rays, getting doing some deep dives. It'll be it'll be a great time. What I should say is there will be a show coming up very soon that you'll definitely want to see the the visuals for because oh, yes. um I I have I've in fact made some visuals for that show. Yes. <laughs> so uh you'll you'll definitely want to stay tuned for that. But yeah, I'm just I'm oh, the season's almost here, baby. I know. It's exciting, and if sooner or later, we'll be doing shows, breaking down games, and I cannot wait for that. Uh, but for now, that's our show. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining and listening, and we will see you very soon in the regular season. But for now, raise up. Raise up. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLI Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.